Hi there. Um, thank you from Costas. Uh, so one of the things that's very important with AI and with data in general is that it can only be as good as the data that's fed into it. Uh, and we call this the GIGO problem in computer science. Garbage in, garbage out. How do we solve this? The situation being that we ourselves are responsible for feeding good data into the machine. Now, what do we mean by good data? There's a whole bunch of words we can talk about. I like to think of data as being reliable, which is to say it's useful to you. Uh, you have a permission or an appropriateness in using it, and there's a benefit to you putting this data into your risk machine. Also, we need a separation of concerns. The poster needs to be separated from you, not too tightly coupled to your use, otherwise we get adverse feedback. What makes data bad? Simply put, it's an asymmetry of consequences. If the poster gets to win by putting the data in and I get to lose by relying, that's not a good result. What we really want is the alternative. We want for me to win as the relying party and for the poster not to lose so that they're encouraged to participate. So there's a bunch of technical ways, which we've heard throughout the conference, about how to put good data in there. For example, to start off with, there are simple facts of existence. You post them. It isn't the content that's factual. It's the fact that you've posted some piece of information. It's a start. Um, but we've got Wikipedia, and they've been doing this for, what, 20 years or so? Uh, we heard from Jimmy Wales about how that works. That really does work as a collector of facts. And to put a cryptographic uh, twist on this, we've got time stamping. Uh, and this is uh, Haber, Stuart Haber of the Haber and Stornetta uh, pair, who did the original work in the early 90s to create time stamping services. These guys are cited in the white paper quite fairly for having created what is, in, is in essence, the first blockchain. And if you look there, um, Stuart's holding up a newspaper. I think it's the New York Times. That advert there is the week's hash that is for the block that holds the hashes of the contents and links back to the previous block, the first blockchain, around about 1994. So we've had that for a long time. Uh, we've also got facts by people. We talk all the time about identities and NIMS and so forth, signing data and so forth. But, you know, good as it is, it's not actually much use. NIMS and names aren't the same thing. Neither are people. People are not the same thing as names. And that doesn't mean that they're reliable, which is what I wanted. Um, this, these images here are all the uh, pictures for one character called Dr. Smith, if you know your lost in space genre. They're all the same person. We all know precisely what this person's name is. We don't get confused any time, even though it changes over time. He, she, it. Um, but this person is completely unreliable. There's also the notion of shared knowledge. We can all share the knowledge um, of some particular issue. You can think about crowdsourcing and shelling points and so forth. Groups do make good decisions on the basis of shared information. But it's easy to fake this stuff. We've got fake news driven by politics, and at the back of it, it's always angry old men. All of those characters there have come out and destroyed the ability for us to think by pushing out all this fake news. Um, another way which uh, we call triple entry is to set up a situation between two cooperating parties where we record the same data of our transactions onto something like the blockchain. We both rely on that entry to exist and to keep our entries in sync. And this results in an accounting system where we can say, I know that what you see is what I see, a wonderful little aphorism done by uh, Richard Brown of uh, R3. Um, and this, this, like all the other techniques, it's there on the blockchain for free. If you're going to stick data onto anything, then you get the benefit of these security and reliability models just by using the blockchain. This is all good. This is free. This is technical, but there are limits to how far we can go. All of these systems can be perverted in one way or another. But if we want to get closer to something like truth, we have to reach further. Truth is really, it's a human quality. It's not a technical quality. We can't build a technical system to tell us the truth. Hence, wonderful stories about oracles and the ring of gaijas and so forth. Um, we have in humanity 
many ways to try and come up with an approximation of the truth. We have authorities, which are generally pretty good until they stop being authorities, which always happens in the end. You know, think about your parents. They were authorities until you got to 18, and then it kind of drifted away. Um, science has its way of dealing with the truth. But if you go deeper into the philosophy of science, you discover that these axioms, these truths, are just convenient starting points for another argument. Uh, courts have their way to create truth. A ruling is the truth, but plenty of innocent people have been hung. Um, if you look at truth in a Bayesian statistics sense, you also get a little bit of an interesting situation. It's subjective information. So if you imagine a test for an error or a mistake, what happens is it'll give you several failure modes. One is it'll call out a mistake, but it's not a mistake. It's actually the truth. The other is that it misses the mistake entirely. And what this tells us is not that we have to tighten up the test, which has got its own trap, but we can't stop and identify all of the errors and mistakes in the data. We're stuck. So we have to come up with a bit of a meta goal here. We have to live and work in the presence of uncertain data, which is how we need to think about how we're going to feed the AIs the machine learning programs on the blockchain. They have to cope with uncertain data. How, how, but we still need to be seen to be fixing the data, improving the quality, otherwise people will be upset about participating. We want to encourage participation. And risk analysis gives a little bit of a clue about this. Risk analysis is its a model, like all models. Uh, what it does is it takes the number of errors that are out there, and it takes all of the possible damages, and it averages it all out, multiplies it, and that gives us the total damage. We can use it to prioritize our attention. But it also tells us that we can reduce our problems two ways. We can reduce the quantity of errors out there, and we can reduce the impact that each error has. So what does that mean? How do we live in the face of uh, multiple errors? Well, it, it comes down to two things, I think. We take care in the data that we post, and we are forgiving of the data of others. Um, what does that mean? If we, if we talk about, say, care, the particular method I'm talking about here, I, I like to call due care. Now, this is kind of a legal concept. What it means is we care for the data to the extent of a situation. There has to be a scenario that tells us what is the due and appropriate way in which we would care for this data. So that tells us the situation must be posted, must be identified, locked into our activity in some fashion. The second thing is we've got to have skin in the game. If we're going to take care, that means we're going to take effort. We're going to spend some effort. So we have to have some sense of consequences, which means what does it mean? It could mean punishment, it could mean loss of money, it could mean, gosh, reputation going down. So there needs to be this feedback loop that we put something at risk when we post, and that good thing can be taken away from us if we do the wrong thing. Which means, again, we need to be dependent on that situation, because doing the wrong thing can always go sky high. So we need a situation defined beforehand, so that our due care is appropriate to the situation and therefore the punishment is also due to that situation. This is actually really hard, especially in a blockchain context. And I'll give you the short answer. What we need to make this happen is community. We need community to create the context of the situation and to give us the feedback loop, to give us the reputation cycle and to control the persons that are in the group. So what does the other thing mean? Facts with forgiveness. I want to be forgiving of the facts that are given to me. Well, there are two things we can do here. We can mitigate the errors by changing them. Now, this is kind of scary with the blockchain context. Everybody wants that immutable data out there. Um, and how do we know it's a mistake? Well, community gives us the first answer. We need a community process for deciding what is a mistake in the data that goes onto the blockchain that other people will rely upon. And if we've got that, then we can move to the next phase, which is to change the data on the blockchain. But gosh, it was immutable, so how do we do that? Well, it's just a design problem. Instead of sitting here and saying it's impossible, no, what we can do is create a two-layer design. We create an index at the second layer, the higher level layer, which points down to the actual data. And the actual data can stay the same, but we can put new facts in there to replace the old facts, revoke them, if you like, and just change the indexing as we move forward. This is just a straight smart contract. The second thing 
we can be, uh, we can do and be approaching with is resilience to the mistakes. And we know how to be resilient. This is a standard business process. We take diversity of sources and we look for independence of sources. So yes, we've got uh, Weather SV and things like that out there. So we need two services or three services or alternate services. Um, independence is very helpful. We also want to prefer volume of lightweight data rather than reliance on highly narrow and critical data, which can be fragile. So in conclusion, um, as, as we get to the point where humans and AIs are working together, uh, the thing is that machine learning needs vast quantities of cheap data. It also turns out, uh, as well as blockchain being able to do that, especially the scalable blockchains, they come with this time stamping stuff already built in. They were, at, they're based on the idea of time stamping. They come with a NIMUS security model which is built in, which is actually quite a big advantage if you compare the security models of the rest of the processes outside blockchain. They also have a notion and an ability to do consensus, to create group truths, and we can do this whole triple entry thing for free on a blockchain. Blockchain is a triple entry system. Um, but to get further, to actually get beyond the technical issues of data, we've still got to strive further. We've got to strive towards human levels of truth. And we can only do that with a community process whereby the care in production of facts reverts back to a community which controls the quality of those facts. And we need to have that forgiveness in place such that we can also adjust our facts when our facts have been shown to be wrong, which can only be done in a community sense of saying, well, okay, the test got it wrong, we've got to fix this stuff. So there are caveats in all this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm saying blockchains can help with this, but blockchains aren't the answer, they're just the toolkit by which we can do this. Um, I also haven't talked at all about identity, and that's because identity is not the answer. Sorry, folks. Community, however, could well be the answer. And the way to think about this is that identity is an outcome of community. I actually want to know not who you are, but which community you come from and what are the controls that are in place for that community, which allows me to rely on you being a good poster. I, I'm interested in your community. Nice to hear your name, but tell me where you come from. Um, so community there is the answer. Now, assuming that you've chosen that the AI uh, is, is properly sourced to place on the, the blockchain and so forth, the good news is that all of these goals, all of these techniques, all of these ideas work together to create a better blockchain. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm here with Ian. You co-authored this paper, and I can't remember the name of it. All I know is that it starts with implementations of... <laughs> Let me read it out. Okay, go. Artificial intelligence implementations on the blockchain, use cases and future applications. So, what does that mean? Because we talked to Konstantinos earlier about the synergy or the where AI and blockchain meet. So is that what this whole paper is about? How you can use AI on the blockchain for the future? What it is, is a theoretical exploration based on a bunch of experiments that we know have already been done about the various components that you would need to put together in place on the blockchain and how you could hook them up together to start reaching towards a vision of a general AI. The AGI or artificial general intelligence is the simulation of a, a complete brain or a unit that can act like a person. We are so far away from that, but we have been able to do various small components such as vision and speech and so forth. And the notion is if we can put different entities onto the blockchain, we can couple them together through communication to start reaching towards this notion of an AGI. Yeah, because when you, when you hear the word AI, I picture like a robot with a very mm. like Siri, but really like a bad Siri or a bad Alexa. Yes. Alexa's getting good though. She's telling me like, have a nice day now and 
Happy Friday. Yeah. <laughs> there's the Hollywood view, and yes. then there's the what's um, the real Amazon. view? What's Tell the, us, yeah. the real view is we can train these things to do one particular task, and they can do it okay. In some cases, they can do it very well, like they can beat us at chess or go. Mm -hmm. But that's all they can do: right. play go, play chess. We're looking for the AI that can start to compete with the human mind on all things. Now that's right. actually, well, it's a bit scary, <laughs> yeah. but it's also very useful if we can do it without losing control. And this is where it kind of gets mm. scary. The people who are most advanced in this area are the big tech companies, you know, the Googles and Amazons and so forth. The problem being they're doing it for their purposes and they're doing it on us, not for our purposes. Right. So there's an issue there. And one notion we're suggesting is that if we can put this thing onto the blockchain, that's publicly available. If we can get the quality of an AI up and going on the blockchain, up that for means everyone for grabs. it's up for everybody to use and to share and to grow and to feed. Yeah. How many years from now do you foresee it happening? How long is it going to take? I don't think we're going to see anything uh, hyper scary in terms of loss of control of real thought processes in less than 10 years. Okay. It's going to be 10, or 20, 30 years like, before that really is, kicks in. Well, there's a lot of things we're being warned about, right? Yes. So, this, this is that's another topic, another show, <laughs> <laughs> another conference. Indeed, indeed, yes. All right. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Ian. I really appreciate okay. it, and Super. now I understand it. I mean, after talking to both of you guys oh, about it. Excellent. So, a little more. <laughs>